Hello, everyone. Um, yes, as Francois said, we're going to be talking about proactive debugging using offensive programming. Um, let's start with a little bit of a, an example here. So we've all done something like this or written code like this. We, we try to malloc a buffer. The allocation fails and we handle it internally. We kind of say, you know, this is not my problem. We're out of memory. I guess I just won't deal with this at this point in time. Or I'll return an error and bubble this up to, to the client, to the caller, and it's not my problem. We've either written code like this or we've worked in a code base like this. Um, I've written code like this um, definitely in my past. Um, and it's frustrating. It's it's defensive programming in a way, like you should be defensive against malloc failing every now and then, um, but it's really poorly done in, um, in all honesty. Malloc failing in firmware and embedded systems is, is a non-recoverable issue. By, by checking whether this buffer is null, you're actually pretending it's recoverable or when it's not. You know, you probably have a memory leak and you need to address it. Again, this is an example, um, but malloc is such a clear example for this sort of thing. Um, all too often, I think we kind of decide that errors are preventable or, or recoverable, sorry, errors are recoverable when they are not. And that is like long stalls in the system, memory leaks, or queues being full, or hardware being stuck in a particular state. They're generally not recoverable. And thankfully embedded systems, um, they reboot really quickly. And so there's not much point in basically like limping along while you have a memory leak and your, your malics are failing completely. Your users are gonna notice that some weird things are failing here and there. Um, if you have a memory leak, you're probably hosed. Um, and then, you know, on the side of malloc is failing, you're probably opening yourself up to eventual memory corruption due to like also bugs that couldn't be caught. Um, and you're going to have unrelated bugs and, and when these issues present themselves, right? Like when you ultimately ran out of memory or when you ultimately had a long timeout that you didn't, you know, address at the exact moment in time, your, your system is going to crash catastrophically later on but it's not going to be near the actual root issue. And so you're gonna be looking at weird bugs that don't make any sense whatsoever. Um, somebody has to eventually deal with these bugs and these issues, and it may be even yourself, but it's probably your coworkers. And defensive programming, you know, when done well, it's, it's great. Uh, it can be, definitely be appropriate at times. And what I like to imagine is anything that you cannot control, you know, inputs, from the outside world, that is, you know, hardware. Hardware um, can be random at times. Third-party libraries, third-party applications. These things are, are code being written by vendors that, you know, that you, you are not going to debug and you are not responsible for them. They have updates. You're going to pull them into your code base. And, and user inputs and, and what's happening over your comp stack. All of these things, you know, <laughs> uh, whether it's intentional or not, could crash your system due to bad input and you need to validate and return um, errors when all of these things are trying to basically give you invalid input. Um, not to mention, it could also be adversarial. You know, you could have some security researcher or a malicious client trying to kind of like inject data into your system um, and you need to validate input on that defensive programming barrier. And you should not crash due to bad input. Um, but there's this item on the left, the internal software. The internal software is everything your company writes. And within that, you do not need to be defensive against everything that's happening in the internal software. Um, you know, that's kind of where malloc and queues being full and this sort of thing lies. You don't need to be defensive of against a memory leak. Like it's a memory leak and you probably should reset the system. Um, you can't pretend like the errors don't happen. In internal software, you can't you you have to address the errors as they happen on the right side outside of the defensive barrier input. And so, if you have to take one thing away from from this talk, it is um, you cannot pretend like an error didn't happen. You can't pass it up a layer to the next person or to your future self, and you have to make it very easy on yourself and coworkers. Um, in this example, we're using an assert to make sure that the malloc succeeded. And 
the benefit of that and the beauty of that, in my opinion, is it will raise the air um, immediately. It will draw attention to the exact point in time at which it failed and probably the first failure so that you can, you know, maybe the memory leak was the most recent execution code path. And that's very easy to track down if you have logs or other like small tracing buffers. And it will allow you to immediately um, raise the error, root cause it, fix it, and then ship an update. Okay, so that was kind of a, a brief hint or, or glimpse into what we're gonna be talking about. What we're actually going to be covering throughout the presentation today is what is offensive programming? Um, we'll get a little bit deeper into that. How one may use it in production, which is the, the, you know, the bread and butter of this talk and is my favorite section. We'll get into the examples of how you would actually use offensive programming in production. And then we kind of like play it side by side with memfault because, you know, if you're asserting remotely in the field on devices halfway across the world, you, you need some sort of system to understand how they're failing. Um, and then some best practices that me, that I've learned over the last, you know, five or six years being a firmware engineer and also being a firmware engineer at Memfault and helping other customers and what we've all learned at Memfault. Cool. And I am your host, as I mentioned, Tyler. I am a co-founder and lead engineer at Memfault. I love developer tools. I, I have been, you know, I was brought in as a firmware engineer at Pebble. I found myself always building developer tools that would enable other people. And at Fitbit, I kind of took that role to the next level. I became, you know, a developer tools engineer at Fitbit, where I, I helped build tools and, and infrastructure and debugging tools similar to Menthol at Fitbit, um, but for like 50 to 100 engineers. When I'm, when I'm not giving presentations on offensive programming, um, I am writing on Menthol's Interrupt blog and I give conference talks. And you can find a lot of what I've written on interrupt.menfault.com. You can also find me on, on Twitter and I'm hanging out in the interrupt Slack pretty much at all times. Cool, so offensive programming, the idea behind it is raising errors immediately and loudly. If, if there is an error that pops up and there's a bug and it's a very you know, well-known bug, the malloc fail, the, you know, we're having a timeout in a weird place, there's this really bad input, this API was used incorrectly, there's, there's almost no point in pretending like the error didn't happen. Um, I love using asserts and, and that is what we're going to recommend basically. If you wanna know more about you know, the best practices on asserting, how to use asserts, um, also asserts can accidentally take a lot of code space if not done correctly. And so how to use asserts properly is all in the blog post linked to the bottom. I also wrote that post um, and they can basically take a very minimal amount of code space, a very minimal amount of CPU and done really well in embedded systems. And so when we're, when we're you know, using asserts, what I mean when you, uh, the place where I want you to use asserts is basically in the internal software block on the left, not in the defensive programming barrier or not you know, in the hardware, hardware stack or places that have random input. And that internal software on the left, it covers a large swath of modules and code. And honestly, it's the majority of the software um, in, your, in your firmware projects, drivers, protocols, GUIs, um, your applications, most of your services, all of the state machines that you've written and anything that basically processes the data once it's validated from the external environment. All of that is in our control or your organization's control or you and your coworkers are all working on, a, on that. And there's no reason to be you know, defensive against all of these layers because they're all in your control. If somebody is misusing an API or if somebody is giving bad input or causing a memory leak, you, know, you should just tap that person on the shoulder and say, can you not use the API this way? Or like, here's the documentation on how to write this. Um, or <laughs> I added an assert so that this doesn't happen in the future. Those are, those are the best. And, and there's more reasons to use asserts than, than just to kind of convince or, or get people to use the APIs correctly. Um, an assert is, is like, I don't even know. It's like raising a, a big red flag saying like, here is the issue. It's infinitely better than documentation. It's going to provide you breadcrumbs as to 
what the issue was, where it was, and sometimes even how to fix it as well, depending on if you have like a message in the, in the assert or, or some comments. Um, most assert implementations will give you a file and a line number. And if you build up the asserting libraries um, and have a core dump maybe, like if, if, if you're using memfault, you would get a backtrace and you would get a, you know um, all of the threads in kind of their context. You'd get way much more. Um, the other reason to use asserts rather than kind of maybe even waiting until another, another assert is hit or waiting until the system catastrophically fails due to a fault or a hard fault or a memory fault um, is because you can raise issues close to the actual root issue. If you assert constantly and at, you know, at the beginning and the end of most functions, you're probably only going to be a few lines away from the actual bug that caused the assert to trigger rather than um, any amount of time later, which would actually cause the system to fault. Um, but the whole other reason why you should assert rather than you know, just debugging is because if an assert fails, you're likely running in an undefined state. Your device is, is not performing correctly. It's either memory corruption. If there was an invalid argument, it could have been memory corruption. It could not be somebody, or it could, it's not always somebody using the API incorrectly. It could actually be memory corruption or, or some bad actor, basically. Um, and if an assert fails, you know, this assert needs to be true. And there's no point in letting a system run in an undefined state and then failing catastrophically because that could, could cause um, the system to write bad data or perform wrong actions for your customers, which could, you know, depending on what kind of device you're using or, or building, um, cause bigger problems than just a like small reset here and there, keeping the system running in a defined state. Um, and you control the, the, the assert handler. You can capture extra logs, data, a core dump, pretty much anything, because when an assert triggers, the system is still in your control, basically. It is not on an interrupt coming in from a fault handler where you need to immediately shut down the system as quickly as possible and, and reset. And so the, the core takeaway here and why you should use asserts is fail fast. And, and especially during development and testing, there's no easier time to fix bugs than, than when they're on your desk in a debugger or, or very close to you um, being used by a coworker basically. We tried to make that much easier with Memfault, you know, even debugging devices halfway across the world. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that. Before we get too much further, I'd actually be curious, and I want to run a poll. Uh, I'm curious how many asserts are in your current project, if you had to give a rough guess. Obviously, it ranges from none to too many to count, which is, I think, where probably the Pebble project was toward, toward the end of my tenure. Honestly, it's looking like an even spread here. I'll give it uh, about 10 more seconds. <clears throat> yeah, so, so about 30% are saying none, about 25% are saying a few, and then tens and a hundreds, about 20%, and then too many to count, 10%. And so I hope I can trend that, that chart a little bit downwards to, to where people are more convinced to actually use asserts. Okay, cool. Continuing onward, <clears throat> what should you assert upon? I've, I've generally grouped them, in, I group this into four categories. The first one, which we touched upon a lot, is programmer error. If, if a developer or yourself or, or somebody comes along and uses an invalid argument to a function, or they maybe call you know, out of order functions. Maybe they forgot to call the init routine before the uh, process routine or something like that. You should just assert on these things and or, or an invalid state machine. Undefined behavior, memory corruption, security issues. You know, if your device is, is operating in a weird state or some values or some state is just invalid, you should assert on it um, and probably repeatedly and every so often as well to make sure that a system isn't running in an undefined state. Resource exhaustion, also touched on this quite a bit. This is like a malloc failure. If your queues are full, <clears throat> your byte pools are, are out of memory, or, or maybe your handles are out of memory due to a leak or something like that. And then last, performance. This one is a little bit more creative, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. 
but yeah, it's, it's cues full. It's if something is stalling for, for more time than it should be, or you basically, you know, set a start and an end timer. And if the, if the time between the two is greater than you expect, go ahead and assert and try to figure out what the system was doing during that time. And so I, I can assume that given, given the number of people that said none and one and 10 asserts that are in your current project, you're probably asking me why, like, why are we using asserts and especially in production? And, and I am telling you that yes, absolutely. Use asserts in production, at least on most of the, most of the time, there are a few places where I wouldn't recommend it, but keep in your asserts, even in production, but what are you going to do when they're halfway across the world? If these, de if these devices are halfway across the world, like, and they're crashing, how are you possibly going to be able to debug them? And honestly, that is where Menfold comes in. And, and we can help you with that. We can give you the, the back traces and a lot of the data that's going in, but that's only the first point. The second point, why you should assert in production is if an assert fails, again, it probably means the device is running in an undefined state. And the safest course of action, you know, for many reasons, is to reset the system back to a known state so that it's running in a defined state. We have a, we have a customer who, who throws buoys off into the ocean all, the, all around the world, so far, so far ocean. And their devices are connected up through a, through a satellite. And when those buoys, they're, they're smart buoys, they're connected, they're, they're doing a lot of processing of data. When those things are experiencing issues or, or crashing, they will send their data up through a satellite, um, through their server, back to Memfault, and then we'll actually tell them, you know, within real time, maybe a minute or a few hours, why their devices are crashing, and and then they can very quickly fix a bug. And that is like, you know, as far and remote as possible. So that's pretty cool. <clears throat> and and why are we actually doing sort of debugging in production? Why can't you fix all of the bugs? in-house, why can't you fix all the bugs before shipping to production, maybe in QA? And the reason is, is QA can't possibly find all the bugs. There are so many bugs, you know, probably due to hardware, but also just the matrix, the test matrix that production um, produces for you. Those one in a thousand hour and one in 10,000 hour bugs are incredibly real. Um, I know from experience working at Pebble, shipping a million devices, we can try to fix all of the bugs we possibly can, but as soon as it hits 1,000 people, 10,000 people, 10,000 watches in the field, we're gonna get reports of like <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of uh, probably unique crashes and we all have to fix them. And, and a couple of the cases where asserts aren't possible, I still recommend logging if possible. Um, ideally you have a logging pipeline. If you, if you can't tolerate asserts and you can't tolerate resetting the system, at least logging them and counting them and assessing them later needs to happen. And for all of this to basically happen, for that circle on the right to, to take place, you need some sort of way to get data back into a system that then you can analyze and look at. And so, yeah, you need diagnostics and reporting from your devices and you need firmware update to be able to fix all of the issues that you find um, due to the issues that you found. And, and the last thing I will say is, if you're not asserting in production, you're probably just pretending that errors and bugs don't exist. Asserts in production is going to equal a quality product, especially if you are able to quickly find and fix them and deploy fixes out in the field. And if you have asserts in production, they're all running and they're all not being triggered, you can be pretty sure that your system is actually operating as it should. And so, yeah, as we mentioned, the, the prerequisites for shipping a device to production, I truly believe that before you ship a device to production, you need this sort of like data pipeline, monitoring pipeline, reporting pipeline. And within that, um, or the system you need to build basically before you get there, basic telemetry and logging, that's usually the first thing that we see customers build. Um, they have some human readable logging functions that, that print to a, to a rolling buffer, and then that gets sent up every so often. So it's like the first step. Second, proper, proper fault handling. Third, assert implementation. Asserts come a little bit later, I think, as well, because why assert if you don't have a diagnostics pipeline? Well, hopefully, uh, you know, Memfault, we can help you, or hopefully this kind of presentation will inspire you to build your own. And then, yeah, getting all that data back into a single system where then you can analyze it. And then from that information, perform a firmware update 
to fix the bugs that you now know that you have. So asserts cap capture a couple of things for you. They, they capture the file and the line number. As, as we mentioned before, that's kind of the, the built-in default C implementation is they'll capture the file and the line number. Um, and they may also capture the expression value, whether that failed or not, or what value it actually was. But you can do so much better and, and I highly recommend it. And it will <laughs> make your debugging and kind of fixing process so much easier and quicker. If you can capture the backtrace of the asserting task, you can get the arguments and the variables within the call stack. So you kind of know, actually that's the best is when you see in a call stack in GDB or in memfault, um, maybe it's like 10 frames of a backtrace. And in the fifth one, you can see one argument change between like a known value and a corrupted value. And then you can know that like, ah, that is where the memory corruption took place. Those are the best and most exciting bugs that I used to find. Um, and if you capture you know, global and static variables, data structures, heap, queues, all of these things. A lot of this comes within a core dump or some sort of custom implementation of, of grabbing memory. All of it comes with um, comes kind of included with memfault. And, and that is what I would capture on an assert. Again, capturing things on asserts while you're still in control, while the system is still under your control and you can safely reboot the system is infinitely better than waiting for a fault to take place and then capturing, you know, maybe the file and line number then. A lot of times it's going to be obscured. A lot of times it's not going to be close to the issue where that actually caused you know, the, the corruption or, or the, the misalignment to take place. So recommending on asserts. To give a brief overview of what mempult is actually looking like, um, you know, this is from an assert or this is from a, a, an assert-like bug. On the left, you could get some sort of stack traces and back traces of all of the threads that are running and the current stack states, whether they're running, suspended, blocked. In the top left, you see that this, this thread is actually stack overflowing. In the middle, um, we're going to analyze a lot of the exception registers. And so all of the registers that get sent up, we do some simple analysis on them, or I, some, in some places simple, in some places really complex analysis on what's going on. Um, and on the right, if you really want the, the memory viewer, you know, it is a core dump. It, we did capture as much memory as you wanted in the system and you can look through that. That's really helpful for kind of digging around where memory corruption took place. And then in that register and locals tab, yes, you can get the um, arguments, parameters that are passed into every function on every single call stack. And you can get the, the values and the, the data structures on all of the global variables that are in your system. And and two things. One, this is like a full picture. This is telling you exactly how the system um, was, you know, behaving in its exact state and time at the time of the assert. Because we asserted, and because we were in control of the system, we were able to grab this memory without, you know, having other things get in our way or or maybe risking a timeout. And then two, this device is is not connected to a debugger. This this device was was. Um, you know, halfway across the country when, when this bug was actually captured, it is now in memfault and you're seeing, seeing the data as if it's like connected to your debugger. And, and it's super powerful. And we see customers <laughs> go from having to reproduce issues over a very long period of time, taking hours or days or, or that one bug that's been happening for six months that no one can really track down with a debugger attached. We have customers that, that have those sorts of like three to six month bugs that are just out there. They connect them in fault. And as soon as they ship it to a 10 or a hundred devices, they'll get one backtrace and they'll be able to fix the issue. And those are great. I love those moments. So that's kind of a, a glimpse at Memfault. I have another poll to, to provide to the, to the group here. I'd be curious. So for the ones that didn't have the, the none um, in the poll, how does your firmware handle assertions in production? I guess I should have added an E for, for doesn't.
Got it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe two thirds of people have responded. Most people assert to compile them with no changes. Yes, <laughs> that is perfect. Um, keep most of the asserts, if not all of them, in as um, as they were designed to be, and the rest is kind of evenly spread out between some assertions turned off, some are turned to logs, and all compiled out. Really recommend not compiling all of them out. That is that is the one I also want you to change. But we'll get into that. Okay, so now some examples. We we have, have talked theoretically enough. And so let's talk about some examples and code and what it actually looks like a mem fault because these devices can be halfway across the world and we're trying to, to help you debug those devices in production. Argument validation. This is one, again, that is generally a developer bug and it needs to be raised immediately. I have spent so much time um, trying to write a new module. You know, let's say I'm tasked with writing a new module that, that does exactly this. You know, it, it's a device info sort of module. I'm like, great, I'm gonna call this function device set name. I'm gonna pass it a buffer. I'm gonna pass it a length. You know, I allocated, oh, no device serials I've ever seen at this company are longer than 20, 20 bytes. I'm gonna pass it a name length of, of, of 20. A lot of these times, these functions that I call are going to return me errors, negative one, negative three, negative 47. And then I have to go read the documentation on what all of this means. And I wish a lot of these functions had just had asserts on these variables because they would immediately tell me why I was using the API incorrectly. But rather what happened is I then spent an hour or two digging through various layers, reading documentation, understanding why the system was running and happy, but also not functioning properly. And so don't gracefully handle bad input, especially when the people using your functions are the developers and people within your organization. Asserts are, are super easy and it's like self-explaining and self-functioning documentation, which I find so great. And in memfault, this is basically what an assert would look like. Again, you get the stack trace, the back trace, and, and all of the registers and locals. And in the top right, we actually store a kind of assert info where you can see the PC and the LR if that's useful, but we're gonna decode those for you and give you a full back trace. And then you can kind of see like what led to this assert rather than just that the assert happened. Another common developer bug that always you could use asserts is state machine errors. State machines always own or have a particular flow through, um, through the path and only a few states can lead to another couple states which require another couple states and, and just trying to figure that out and, and detect errors. Asserts are gonna be the most useful way to do that. And again, it's likely a developer bug. And if it's not a developer bug, then it is a root bug or it's a core bug and it should be fixed anyways. And so the easiest way to solve those is just to add asserts on every single state transition with every, within every single function. <clears throat> um, as, as we've mentioned before, Malix, I'm a firm believer in believing that firmware, when, it, when it's running out of keep or running out of a, you know, a resource, it is not transient. It is not going to recover. It is, it is better to just fail because there's probably a leak somewhere else. And so what I had here was a malloc underscore assert. And what I've used in previous code bases is basically 99% of all function calls that call malloc call this malloc assert, which then under the hood just you know literally does that malloc and then assert pointer for the one or two cases where malloc can fail, maybe it's like a debug API or something that really doesn't matter and it's only like you know brownie points if you can get it, then you can call malloc, but generally use malloc assert. <clears throat> Which leads me to one of my favorite features of Impulse and one that our customers have been loving recently is we recently added maybe three, three months ago or so is a, um, a heap viewer in the UI. If you kind of instrument your heap <clears throat> with a kind of a module that we've written, we can track, give me one second. <clears throat> we can track 
the number of allocations in the heap. We can track obviously the, 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 the greatest number of size, where they're allocated from and, and group them together and give you a really good idea on whether you have a memory leak or not. And most of the people that have been using this can clearly see that, oh yeah, I don't need, you know, 472 allocations of this one buffer that should only ever exist. Like one should only ever exist. So this is really great. Um, and it's all in the UI and mempool. You can also assert on performance issues. And this one is, this one is um, more of on the creative side, I would say. If a queue is full, there's likely a performance issue. The, the RTOS is not regularly flushing out the queue or operating on it, or some, one, one or two tasks are taking too long. And so what you can do here, since you have a reporting pipeline, since you now have memfault, maybe reporting core dumps, and you have the state of the entire system, you can just check if this queue insert took too long, maybe a second, let's just assert, let's just like bail, assert that it was successful or not. And then um, when I get that back into my, back into the lab, you know, maybe you get the core dump back into your lab, you can then analyze the queues, what was in it. Oh, look, it was, you know, all filled with BLE packets. We probably had a, a bad acting BLE device, or maybe the Bluetooth task was had too low of a priority due to other things and it wasn't processing fast enough. All of these things are, or these types of bugs are incredibly difficult to reproduce. And the only way you're going to, to be able to, actually you may not even be able to reproduce them in certain environments. So the only way to find them is to be offensive and, and kind of assert on them or, or really track them down hard. And what this may cause, you know, if you're going to, to deploy this to production, it may cause for a few customers, very briefly, some pain, but you'll be able to fix the root issue. Maybe this one has been lingering for months. Another thing, so queue inserts, you can also assert on whether a mutex was grabbed in a particular amount of time. This one, we're, we're waiting for a second and we're asserting that the, the mutex was grabbed. You can also mutex lock and you can wait for infinity. And if you have a software watchdog or a hardware watchdog, you can let that um, module clean, clean it up as well. This is an example of a software watchdog being caught or software watchdog catching a software skull in mempool. You can see that the spy flash erase complete was taking too long to run. It was the running task at a particular point in time. And uh, the software watchdog, which is the active interrupt, kind of came in, cleaned it up, captured a core dump. And then that's what you're seeing in the memfault interface here. These, uh, man, yeah, they're, 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 there's so many times where just being a little bit more aggressive, especially internally, you know, debugging builds, internal builds, and then like the, the small cohorted beta builds that you release externally to small groups of people. If you can kind of tighten a lot of these timeouts and tighten a lot of the restrictions and start experimenting and playing, and maybe it'll produce a couple more crashes here and there. But if you can really get a grasp on what is taking a while in your system and where the performance issues are, it's great. It's super great, especially if you get all the data. The last couple examples I want to give Stack Overflow detection. Many RTOSs now have this built in. I would recommend double checking your Stack Overflow implementation. Um, the Embedded Artistry has a great blog on how to build your own. And then I know that Free RTOS and the Zephyr Project and a bunch of other, or in ThreadX, a lot of these other RTOSs have some sort of detection built in. You just need to make sure that it's enabled. Not all errors have to be caught at runtime. And, and in, the, in the spirit of failing fast, you can fail even faster and sometimes even at compile time. And so if you aren't using you know, static asserts in, in your compiler, I would highly recommend them too. These are issues that can be caught at compile time. And what we primarily use them for in my past was asserting that the, the size of structures don't change. Maybe people you know, wanted to kind of flip the order or, or add a new field. And I would basically write a, an error, basically, or, or saying the struct has grown past the known size. This was a, a structure that was written on persistent storage or maybe in the file system, or it's a protocol sort of struct. 
please don't change it. Or if you want to change it, please go to this wiki page. You know, these errors and these log statements aren't saved in the firmware. They're only done at compile time. So you can write as much as you want, basically. And so if you can push things to compile time, that's even better. Final section I want to touch on is best practices. There, there are so many things that we've learned over time. I'm only going to touch on a few of them. If you want to know more, we have a ton of blog posts on Interrupt. So the, you know, all of the all of them are probably stuck out in there, but also you can feel free to reach out to me. First one, and probably the most important one, is when you start adding asserts, a, a boot loop or a, a boot loop may present itself. If you have an assert during the boot initialization phase, there, there is a high likelihood that you're going to have a boot loop, especially if that system or hardware or, or it's literally a programming error um, doesn't fix itself. And so boot loop detection is a must. And what this means is counting the number of resets that has happened in a particular window of time. And if it's you know, higher than a certain number, at Pebble, we used three within 15 minutes. I've seen other people use you know, 10 within one minute. That's a, that's a really aggressive boot loop. If, it, if that many crashes take place, boot up into safe mode. And the safe mode firmware is a, is a whole nother firmware that is completely separate from your primary firmware. It is ideally very rarely, if ever changed, and it only does three things, firmware update, polling of diagnostics, and a factory reset. For more information on that, Francois, the, the CEO of Infault, who, who you briefly heard from earlier, wrote a wonderful post on it, the device firmware update cookbook. Please read that. Um, it has great information on how to basically build a, a very robust bootloader and, and firmware loading system. So don't skip out on this. Another one, I like to build asserts into wrappers. Um, a lot of my job at Fitbit was convincing or teaching or, or writing wiki pages on basically how to use asserts and best practices of asserts and convincing people to add them when they needed to. And what I found was a lot easier and honestly just better in general and it made the, the code base a lot cleaner was just to add wrappers. And so it's very easy to say, instead of using malloc, please use malloc assert. And then now all of the malloc asserts are now asserted and, and that's fine. Instead of having to convince people to, to use the assert function, you can just wrap it and then everyone just uses the wrapper. And this would be the same thing with like mutex lock. Just create a mutex lock assert, have that be the function that almost everyone uses. And then all of that stuff is built in. And, and it also gives you kind of an, an entry point if you need an extra couple pieces of information when it's asserting or before it's inserting or asserting, sorry, you can add that there. Last one, debug builds are your friend. I am not recommending that everyone or anyone, you know, immediately goes off and puts a bunch of asserts in your code base or firmware project and then immediately ships to production, that'll almost never work. And, and those devices may, may have boot loops and may become brick. And so you really need to be testing on debug builds. You know, we had nightlies um, have firmwares that are released very frequently and, and are basically put out to internal testers and to coworkers and to you know, your, your legal and HR teams, they should be trying to use their devices. And, and if these devices experience a bug, let it be known. Don't try to sweep these bugs under the rug. Like by, by using defensive programming improperly, like you're, you're accidentally sweeping the bugs under the rug, but by asserting and then not telling people that there's bugs, you're, you're actually sweeping them under the rug. So at Pebble, what we did there, we had a screen on the Pebble device. It was a smartwatch. We actually, you know, whenever a device reset due to an unknown reason, which was literally any reason except for clicking the shutdown button, we'd prompt the user with your Pebble just reset, please file a bug. And you had to dismiss that manually. Um, and honestly, we had people reporting bugs from all over. It was fantastic. And, and on debug builds, you actually get, you have more of a playground. You can experiment more. You can enable more aggressive asserting. You can tighten a lot of these timeout durations. If, you're, if your system has, if it needs to react within you know, 500 milliseconds, 
you can tighten some of these durations or timeouts to like 300 milliseconds internally. And if it's getting close to that 500 millisecond range, assert and figure out what the system is doing. You know, that can be on a one-off build here and there. I know we had people at, at Pebble that would just want to know the occurrence of something, or they wanted to know how often does A, B, and C happen at the same time. And they would just <laughs> ship out a build with a random assert here and there. And then they were just trying to basically capture a bunch of core dumps and capture a bunch of state from these devices and then analyze them. And then they were like, okay, cool. You've all suffered enough. <laughs> Your devices have been resetting enough. Like we have all the information we need. Here's a bug that doesn't have that assert in there anymore. Thank you for your time and like pain. Um, this is why most of us wore two watches at Pebble. <laughs> um, and yeah, and that's, that's kind of in the category of like test, experiment, try things, be creative. You can assert on anything, any state, any time. Um, again, not necessarily in production, but at least internally. And as long as you have some sort of boot loop detection and, and um, stability, you should be fine. Cool. That is pretty much all I have. So if I have, you know, to leave you with five things, here they are. Don't play defense against bugs if there are bugs and, and developers are using things incorrectly or you've written in bad or you written bad code, just, just root them out, raise these errors immediately. Fail fast and capture data. Capture data probably using you know, some tools that you build or Mimful. Test internally as much as possible. Debug builds are your friend and everyone at your company is probably willing to help test <laughs> to make sure that these uh, you know, products succeed ultimately. Keep a search in production. I hope to see that number go from 30% from of none to like 0% of none. And we at Mimfall would love to help you along this journey because we've done it before and we've seen a lot of you know, success cases from our current customers. Thank you. Again, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, Interrupt. And we are hiring. We are hiring for many roles, especially for a firmware and or firmware solutions engineer. And so if that sounds like it's interesting to you, please reach out to us or me. Go onto our website and, and use the little like chat bubble. In any way we can we can we'd love to talk to you. And now we'd like to open it up to questions. And I awesome. will let Francois kind of take it over. Awesome, Tyler. Um, this was a great presentation. And, you know, although I've watched it a couple of times now during your rehearsals, I'm learning something new every time. Um, we've got a bunch of questions. I've answered as many as I could already. <laughs> some, some I'm going to send you away. Um, and I'm going to start with a question from Carlos Diaz, a, a regular of the Interrupt Slack, who's, who asks, uh, can asserts have different behaviors when they trigger on debug versus release builds? Yes, and it's probably a good idea that they do that they do so as well. There are a few types of there are a few different things I would do here. Um, for the asserts that are kind of detecting memory corruption or bad API usage or something that will never work. Like it is, it is a true bug. I would just keep the assert implementation as normal. For the things that, that um, don't matter as much, you can, you can define different types of asserts that do different things. Maybe they have different, different restrictions. Um, and then for the ones that like are just superfluous, you're just kind of experimenting things like please only assert on this internally. You can just use a um, compile time or, or macro to compile that out when you're actually releasing the firmware. And then also like you have full freedom over what you wanna do with the asserts between debug and release builds. You just define a macro differently. The, the beauty of memfault is you can, you can get the full featured sort of assert with core dumps and backtraces and capturing all the data. You know, it's probably useful to keep those both in production and in debug, because even if you're debugging locally, like you may not have had the, the debugging session running while it's connected to your debugger. But I hope that answered your question. Um, we definitely had multiple different types of asserts, but primarily just kept like one standard one that didn't change for like 95% of the asserts. 
Um, Nick Miller makes a comment that I think you might be interested in expanding on. He says, um, I also like using asserts as a lazy unit test. It's not as good as a unit test, but it's better than nothing. I thought you could maybe riff a little bit on how asserts can make unit testing better. Cool. Um, yeah, so two things here. I've seen asserts used obviously in a lot of creative ways. Um, one thing I know a lot of people do is when they write a new module, you know, usually you write a new module, add some new unit tests to it, like on the side, and then verify that this module works as correct, uh, correctly. What I've, what I've seen people do is when they write the new module, they will add asserts for every single argument that gets passed to every single function in this new module. And they will add asserts for every single return value that gets returned from that function. And they will add asserts kind of throughout that module. And that is, you know, the, the I guess not lazy way of it, unit testing, it's like production way of lazy uh, testing. You're, you're testing in production. Anyways, that module gets written, it gets used internally, maybe a couple of asserts get fired those bugs get fixed and then you ship it to production and as soon as that module stops reporting a lot of or any errors at all or tripping any asserts in that module you can then either compile out those asserts or only keep the ones that are testing parameters and api usage rather than the ones that are kind of littered throughout the code base making sure that you yourself did the right math or subtracted the right values and whatnot um and then in general like your unit testing framework has infinitely more asserts. You can assert memory regions. You can assert that things were in linked lists. You can assert numbers and strings and, and you have an entire library of, of assertions that you can use in the unit test library. But in the firmware, you're probably just going to assert whether things are null, certain lengths, or you know, is this an exact value? So you're more limited generally. But I've seen that used and I love the usage of it. Um, I'm actually going to take this one. Reza uh, asks um, whether asserts really make sense in production. Um, he says that a combination of logging plus a watchdog seems more reasonable in his in his opinion. Um, if they are, he says that if there are enough logs, oftentimes he thinks the issue can be root caused. And um, to me, this is a really important point. Uh, first. You know, there, there are many ways to do this, uh, but, but we believe that asserts and keeping asserts in, in uh, production is the best, easiest, and least error-prone way. And I'll explain a little bit why. Fundamentally, what this comes down to is um, avoiding further damage and collecting information as close to the site of the error as possible. So let's think about a, a you know, a, a, a real example. Let's say that we have a, a malloc function that fails and we did and we improperly we don't properly check that it fails, right? What would you do anyways? Your malloc fails and you you, you end up using an invalid pointer um, and passing it up and down your stack. And sometimes later on uh, in your code you dereference that that pointer that it's it's null and your system crashes. Best case scenario, your system just crashes a little bit later, but you don't necessarily know where the problem occurred. So now you've got to do some, you know, archaeology and reading through your code to figure out how could this pointer possibly have been null. There might be multiple ways that could have happened. And fixing the problem, if it didn't happen right in front of you, becomes really, really difficult. So by just letting the watchdog clean up, you might actually never be able to root cause the problem if you didn't capture information right when the problem occurred. The second thing is also that um, not asserting, letting your system continue running and waiting for the watchdog to eventually catch it can lead to corrupt data corruption. It can open up security issues on your device and it can even sometimes break your device. So for example, here again, let's say that you have a stack overflow that you don't handle or you don't validate inputs on a function. You didn't assert on the val validity of the inputs. And so you end up writing uh, past a buffer and you overwrite a data structure that later on ends up being you know, used to uh, you know, end up being traversed. And now your code is gonna 
try to traverse this corrupted data structure, it might infinite loop and reset. Or worse, that data structure might end up being written to Flash and you might end up with corrupted data on Flash which your device will never recover from. So long story short, once you know a, a, a bug occurs, pretending like your system can continue running leads to worst outcomes and you're much better off resetting and getting back to a good state. This is why we think asserts should be kept both during development and in production. I hope that, that I kind of hammered that point in well, Reza, <laughs> and uh, happy to talk about it some more. Um, not, not one, one last comment, not to mention, you're just kind of wasting time. Like if the bug is there and it's known, just assert and you can fix the bug way more quickly than like hoping you'll find the bug later or hoping that the watchdog triggers. Uh, Ryan Dubois, uh, hi Ryan, a former colleague of mine, um, asks how large are the core dumps you're typically capturing with mempools, and do you face challenges shuttling that much data over the internet? We uh, the way mempool captures a core dump is we can, can you can configure it to basically capture as much as or as little as you want. Some systems have you know 64k of RAM, 128k of RAM, 256. Those people, depending on what they're connected over, will just capture the whole core dump. But some people, again, like so far Ocean, uh, I think they get an allocation of you know maybe a few hundred bytes a day over a satellite, and so they're only capturing um, a couple of the stacks in the regions or the, the region of memory that they place the stack using a linker script, and then maybe a couple more variables that they care about. And so you can get a core dump of the things that matter in probably two or three or four K. And we also do you know, a very simple run length encoding compression. And so that could even be much smaller and especially it won't, the zeros won't waste space. We haven't seen many people be too adverse to sending core dumps back to memfault, especially if they can capture what they want. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, Marco has a pretty long question. I'm gonna try to read the, um... I'm going to try to give you the spark notes. Basically, he says, <laughs> should asserts be used when communicating with external chips, such as sensors, transceivers, and others? He says that probably this would make things simpler. But then again, if the chip misbehave, you might end up in, in a boot loop. Um, so, so do you think you should assert on input from, from external components? I don't believe you should, unless unless you've proven at some point in time that that chip is going to behave correctly, you know, 100% of the time. At Pebble, we had a very similar situation. We, you know, we, we went from an onboard BLE chip and an MCU, they, they were together. So we had control over both of them and we asserted, you know, the data that was passed back and forth. We went from that system to an, an onboard MCU plus a separate M0 Bluetooth chip. And, Generally, um, we had CRCs in place. We had between you know transferring data. We had some CRCs in place. We had our own protocol. As as long as the data was intact there, um, we could then kind of assert on the data that was being passed back and forth. But we also wouldn't crash the entire system. We would crash one chip or the other chip, and we would also capture core dumps from both chips at some points in time. Um, which would just help us figure out what was actually wrong. I don't think there's a great answer for you though. Um, but if both chips are needing to be operating perfectly at the same exact time, and, and one operating, you know, if you get bad input from your second chip and it's wrong, you probably should need to reset the system or at least reset that chip and get it back into a known state. And so an assert may be, you know, the poor man's way to do that. I think if you if you have any elaboration on that, Francois, please. Yeah, thinking thinking out loud, you know, I think let's say that we have a component that gets damaged and no longer provides good inputs. So your device is is broken at that point. What would we want to happen? I think in a way, asserting on that data could actually lead to the right outcome, where you know you get that bad input, you assert, you reset, you boot again, you get that bad input again, you assert, you reset. Eventually, your boot loop detector, you know, uh, uh, gets triggered, and your device detects a boot loop, and it boots into a safe mode that hopefully doesn't depend on that chip. 
Um, and in that safe mode, it has it, it shows an LED pattern or it shows something on the screen that says contact support. There's something really bad with your device, right? And that might be a reasonable way to actually figure out which devices need to be replaced. Um, if they're kind of constantly getting into a boot loop while validating hardware inputs. So food, food for thought, I think that could be, that asserts could be a way to do it there. Even better would be to actually detect hardware failure separately. Um, we've got a few, whoa, a bunch more questions. We're gonna try to uh, maybe speed up the pace, Tyler, all right? Okay. Short answers only from here on out, lightning round. Um, Carlos asked another answer, uh, another question. He says, is it recommended to have some unit tests that validate assertions being triggered? In other words, do you test your assert function with your unit tests? I believe it's possible in the C++ sort of realm of unit tests or, and assertions. I would say yes, I would test them because if that assert is invalid, your device may be running an undefined state. I wouldn't say that it's something that I do 100% of the time, though, to be honest. They're usually simple cases. Like, is this greater than this? Um, Mohammed, I'm sorry. I, I, you asked a question, but I'm not sure I understand it. So I'm going to skip it. But send us a note, and we can chat. Uh, Pierre-Yves Rico asks, um, um, Oh, Pierre Ivrico just shares a, a post from Facebook about you know using offensive programming in you know other places than firmware. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna uh, share that with everyone. Um, and he posted he posted a link to it. Offensive programming, of course, can be used everywhere, um, but in the firmware world, oftentimes it it hasn't quite kind of entered the the general consciousness. So we're trying we're evangelizing the approach. Um, Radim asks, are there any disadvantages to offensive programming and, and liberal use of asserts? The only one I can think of is kind of using them without testing. If you, if you add a bunch of asserts and don't test them internally, then what will happen in production is your devices will trigger these asserts probably constantly and you'll get a flood of these bugs or a flood of customer support requests. I haven't seen many drawbacks of offensive programming if the soak time and the amount of hours testing internally is sufficient. Uh, I will also say that, um, you know, in order to be successful with offensive programming, you need a solid logging and error reporting system. Because if you have a lot of asserts and they're happening in production, you need a way to fix them. So. One of the weaknesses of this offensive programming approach is that it depends on good infrastructure. And this is why we build things like core dump collection, error logging, trace events, um, log collection, metrics at mempult. It's because we believe that this offensive approach paired with good logging solutions is the best way to do development. Um, but of course it comes at a cost of slightly higher overhead, more complex systems. So I, I would say that that's part of the, the, the trade-offs you're making here. Um, Narayan asks, um, any specific recommendations for severely memory constrained systems that have no remote communication, um, no, no way to kind of communicate with the cloud? Gotcha. That's I a tough one. It if you want. <laughs> um, my, only, my only thing here is like, I would still keep in asserts, especially the ones that would cause your device to behave erratically or, or running an undefined state or, or causing, you know, mem or causing corruption in other ways. But in terms of, of getting the data back, there has to be some way that somebody can plug something in and get data back. But yeah, there's not much else I guess you can do there. You can also elaborate, Francois, if you have any. Yeah, just, just log the asserts and the core dumps to flash. Um, this is something that we do support with Mempol. So in, if you don't have a way to push things through the internet, just serialize the data structure that contains your diagnostics to flash so that if a device is returned to you, at the very least, you can read the flash and figure out what happens, right? Um, and and um, of course, it's not a perfect answer, but it's better than nothing. Uh, Nick Miller shares a comment, um, an alternative to changing code to something like malloc asserts 
is to write functions like malloc using the GCC linker. You're mm -hmm. correct, Nick, although one downside to that approach is that it can be surprising. Um, and your colleagues may not appreciate that the malloc function kind of magically changes behavior. Um, so instead, we, we recommend kind of explicitly creating a function with a different name so that they know that it has a slightly different behavior. Um, André Morea asks, um, regarding system errors and thinking about IO and file system errors in particular, these can usually have a variety of causes, some of which I can see failing under the action range of an assert and some not. Do you have any take on this kind of errors? I think if I understand well, it's, it's like, what if you're asserting in the system that asserts needs to work? I don't think I understood your, your extra point. Uh, I can comment oh, a little bit on, go ahead. Matthew. His question is, let's say that you have assert and asserts writes to flash to store the assert data. Oh, what oh, if I you're see. asserting in the flash codes, right? It's in the IO and file system codes. What about cascading asserts? How do you handle that? I think we've done this in the past by having a Boolean that is set on the assert flow. And so that if you basically trigger nested asserts at one point in time during that assert flow, you will check if you are already in an assert. <laughs> and if so, basically bail out of that assert and don't, don't perform any action. Um, but I will say we, we, we always have that bug every single time when, that, when the, the first time that happens on a new code base, but I think that's the way we handle it. And the last questions comes from Ananya who says, I'm concerned, that, I'm concerned that asserts can reduce performance. How profuse should asserts be? Should they be caller or call, the, the responsibility of the caller or the, or the callee? And does not asserting or no, does asserting on, non -glo, on global variables uh, affect performance? It depends on how performance constrained your MCU is. I would argue that in today's world, with the MCUs that most of us, most of us are probably using, you know, the M3, the M4 phase, asserts won't impact performance greatly. I know at Pebble, we have, you know, a 30 frames per second UI. We were rendering UI and animations constantly connected to a bunch of devices. Um, we were doing a lot on the Pebble device and we had tons of asserts and there was never, ever a question of, or, or a concern or a measurement or noticeable difference, whether we had these asserts compiled in or compiled out. And I've also never really heard the argument from any firmware developers that we've talked to that asserts will cause issues performance-wise. The one thing again that, that can happen is asserts can bloat your firmware code base if not done correctly. And so there are some ways to, to reduce that code size usage, which read that assert post and there's a bunch of you know, tips and tricks on that. I, I'll add, like, we can actually reason about the performance overhead of an assert. When you're on a pipeline processor, so Cortex-M, Cortex-A, kind of any modern 32-bit MCU or CPU is a pipeline processor. And on, on, on a pipeline processor, you worry about the, you, you know, like, this is what the assert will be. It will often be a single instruction. It will be a branch if not equal. On ARM, I think that's the BNE instruction. So first, a single instruction is a pretty low overhead. Second, you can make the overhead even lower by, by lowering the impact of your branch by priming your branch predictor. Compilers like GCC or others can actually allow, allow you to give hints to the compiler about whether something is likely or unlikely to happen to prime the branch predictor. So in your assert function, you can tag it as unlikely to happen, which will tell your branch predictor to predict it as branch not taken, which means that it will, it will be a single instruction, a single cycle with no pipeline stall and no kind of branch flush, which means it's very, very low overhead. It's a single cycle. Um, so a single cycle on a modern MCU, which can be like, a 200 megahertz or something like that <laughs> is, is negligible performance overhead. Um, of course, when you have very, very, very tight loop, you have very, very, very real time code that is down to the fraction of a microsecond or down to the microsecond uh, in terms of precision, then you, you probably can't have asserts in that, in that code path, but that's very, very rare. In most cases, the single cycle 
with the, with the branch prediction used properly and, and the, the single instruction assert uh, is, is, is a very, very low cost to pay. And with that, that was our last question. We went a little over. So thank you to those of you who were, who were able to, um, uh, to, to stay with us today. And um, we look forward to um, getting your feedback in, the, uh, in the, uh, the questionnaire we're about to send out. Once again, we will send you, we will, we will raffle uh, Amazon gift cards uh, with, the, with the questionnaires. And we look forward to having you on our next webinar. Thank you. Get in touch and have an amazing rest of your day.